And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word, the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to pick it up with verse 20 here in a moment. We're dealing with uh, Ahab, Jezebel, Elijah, and uh, Naboth. And Naboth had inherited from his father a little, a nice little fruitful place. As a matter of fact, Naboth means fruitful. And Ahab wanted it. And Jezebel got it for him by having Nahab and his, um, and all of his, uh, Naboth rather, and all of his kids, children, offspring killed. And Ahab has walked out and he's admiring his garden and guess who walks up? God sent Elijah. You don't mess with a man's inheritance, especially the type being spiritual. Our God gets very unhappy, as we'll find out. With that thought in mind, as, um, as Elijah has approached and Elijah stated, what have you done? Murdered a man and now you're taking over? All right, we'll pick it up with that thought, a word of wisdom from our father, verse 20. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, you made a slave of yourself to evil in the sight of Lord and poor of the Lord. And poor old Ahab, it seemed that, that he was so easily influenced by evil forces, especially that he was married to Jezebel, that he was not strong enough to resist or to be the king he should have been. But um, no doubt he had, as I stated in the last lecture, he had some good qualities, but he was a wet noodle. He couldn't stand up for anything. Verse 21, Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, the Lord speaking to him. And I will take away thy posterity. That's to say, your children, you're not going to have any. And will cut off from Ahab him that urinateth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. In other words, I'm going to do you out of business. Now, this is not talking about all of Israel, but Ahab's family. Verse 22. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam. Remember, the same thing happened to him the son of Nebat, uh, and like the house of Beasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. You know, God does not appreciate people that will mislead his people in the name of religion. It would seem that Ahab had a gift of having around him fake preachers or priests or prophets. And he would call true prophets of God, such as he has Elijah here, his enemy, because they never said anything good about him. Why should they? It was, they speak for God, and he was a, a slave. He'd sold himself, that means a slave, to doing what's wrong. God does not. Uh, suffer a false prophet or a false teacher. He cuts the blessings off rapidly. Verse 23, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs, this, this was God's sentence upon Jezebel, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. That to not have a decent burial was insult of insults. And it shows Jezebel coming to that state, simply killed, thrown in the ditch, and which this is what, that's the base word for wall here is ditch in the Hebrew. And the dogs eating her, 24. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. That's your children. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. In other words, none of Ahab's children would have a decent burial either. And that went for Ahab also. Verse 25. 
but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself, in other words, made a slave of himself, to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. She incited him. He would do anything to just get along. And I, I keep stressing that because that's exactly the point the Father wants you to understand, that just getting along and pleasing men, rather than standing for the truth in God's Word, or being a king of God's children as he was supposed to, he'd just rather slip along and get by best he could. And Jezebel certainly was one to take advantage of that. Verse 26. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. He, what it's saying here is he was just as bad as the heathen himself. And he was king of Israel. He was just as bad as the Babylonians. Verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. That means he really humbled himself, talking to himself, and, and uh, feeling very sorry from within that he had done these things. Now that shows you inside he had some good qualities. I mean, this will even impress God, all right, that he actually humbles himself before God in this manner. He really feels bad, genuinely feels bad that he has let the Father down. Now, however many traits, but this is what a wet noodle will get for you, or this is what listening to men rather than God's Word. God, you know, you can be as religious as you want to, but if it's man's religion, as, as these priests and prophets were that served uh, Ahab and Jezebel, um, God, that that's almost a greater insult to our father than just being a heathen, all right? He doesn't like people that mislead his children, all right? Verse 28, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, I mean, this is what God said about his having humbled himself and repented. 29, seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? You see that, Elijah? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. In other words, when he repented and when he really humbled himself before God, God repented himself and he said, I will wait and destroy his children after he's gone, because that would be exceedingly painful. But you know Ahab, how long does a wet noodle stay on course, you know? A wet noodle goes, seeks the least resistance. I mean, it's their nature to listen to man. If, example, in this generation, if somebody says, yes, there's going to be a rapture. Now, well, show, show me the word rapture in the Word of God. You know? God is not, he does not appreciate people adding or taking away from his word, especially if they make a religion out of it, to deceive people, you see. In other words, what is my point? Stick to God's word. Humble yourself before God and those of mankind that will allow you to. All right? Think about that. Humble yourself before God and those men that will allow you to. Some people you cannot humble yourself before because they don't understand an humble person. They take it as weakness. That's when you must be bold and sharp because an humble person before God is not, is not a wet noodle that will listen to, to men without checking them out in the Word of God, that goes for this man or any other man. 
So let's see how long he stays that way. Chapter 22, verse 1, let's go with it. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. Boy, hey, that's pretty, going pretty good. This is when the vineyard thing took place is while they were not at war. And after God himself had given uh, the Syrians into his hand, it, it, peace follows. Verse 2, and it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, now bear, bear in mind your houses, you've got the house of Israel now and the house of Judah, the king of Judah came down to the king of Israel. Well, I would say came up, but be that as it may, uh, it doesn't uh, matter. And, uh, they, had, they had an alliance, so they were getting along fine. As a matter of fact, uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, uh, Jehoshaphat's son married Ahab's daughter, so they had a covenant by marriage as well. Verse 3, And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilad is ours, and we be still, in other words, we're at peace about it, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And you'll remember back in, what, chapter 20, along about verse 34, somewhere in there, the king of uh, Syria, had he, he volunteered to return uh, that uh, city and, um, and many other things. Well, he hadn't done it. He didn't intend to keep his word when Ahab gave him his life. He, did, he, he did not intend. So he's, a propos he's about to proposition the king of Judah to, we've had three years of peace, but uh, the, the uh, Syrians are not giving up our property. Verse 4, And he said to Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle in Ramoth Gilead? And this is Mount of the Rocky Region, all right, fully translated. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. In other words, Whatever is mine is, is yours, and whatever yours is mine, as far as this battle's concerned, if you call on us, we will be there. We will be there. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, watch this, now this is the difference between men. I mean, Ahab's got all he wanted. If he's got Judah helping him, hey, that's good enough. Hey, let's get it on. But the king of Judah, listen to this. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. See? You go to the Father, you go to a prophet, and inquire if God wants us to do this before we jump off out here and do it. Now, that's the mark of a king. But you can even want to be religious, as Jehoshaphat did, and yet you still must be very careful, and really that's the lesson we're going to learn is, uh, and you're going to learn a great deal about God's emotions and his feelings, both joy and anger, from this very deal, from this very thing. Okay, now bear in mind, he asked, is there a prophet around here we can go to where we can pray and find out what God thinks about this? Verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, whoa, we got prophets, right? And said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? Question. And they said, the prophet said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now watch closely. These were prophets that really got their orders from a calf. They weren't the prophets the, that had approached Elijah before, but the, and they called themselves men of God, even, even called themselves as serving Yahweh. But how did the calf get involved? You got it? I'm doing your thinking for you. That's the way you question yourself. But what is, what is this extra stuff we've got going on in this camp of so-called uh, prophets here. What, what, what are they using? A calf? That would remind you of Jeroboam uh, 
Um, and uh, his building the golden calves for the people to worship rather than going to Jerusalem, Judah's headquarters. All right, you see my point? Now, uh, next verse, all right? And verse 7 reads, And Jehoshaphat said, Is, I mean, he looks this bunch over, and he's thinking right, because watch his reply. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? In other words, um, he knows these prophets are fakes. He knows their religion is false, even though they claim to be servants of Yahweh, the living God. It's obvious to someone that is trained in the Word of God to tell a fake when he sees one, and probably they thought in their own right, oh, you can rest assured. I mean, they were holy men, holy to a calf. I'm telling you, my friend, you'd better be careful in this last generation. You'd better humble yourself before God, as I stated, and he has written you a letter. He has given you these historical things as types to check your life out by today. And you'd better pay attention, because we're in that time that um, God is going to disappoint a lot of people because if they're not in the Word of God, and if they followed some fictitious great super bunch of preachers because of denominationalism or something else, they're in trouble. It doesn't matter what you call yourself, priest, prophet, or whatever, bishop, if you like. And I'm not picking on any particular religion. I'm saying if it doesn't come from the Word of God, you've got trouble. For there is only one God and there is only one letter and it was written to you. And if you haven't taken the time to read it with understanding, then I'm sorry for you, friend. You're in trouble. Verse 8. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, or Micah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said, Let not the king say so. Don't talk like that. I mean, here we're about to go to war, and you're talking about a prophet saying you hate him. And Jehoshaphat dresses him down. Um, it takes more than just dressing someone down. I will guarantee you that in this generation, in this, mo this is only a type, but in this modern generation, if you teach God's Word chapter by chapter and line by line, you're not going to be a popular individual, not with the religious community, because um, it doesn't matter what men think. I'm going to teach my Father's Word as it is written because I would lot rather be unpopular with men than I would be unpopular with my father. Because it is from my father, not men, that blessings flow. Knowledge, wisdom, gifts, um, gifts of teaching and so forth. And as long as you toe the mark, God will always bless you. You can count on that. Men, hey, let the chips fall where they may. Now, Micah, you'll remember, is, uh, and it's one of the reasons Josephus thinks he was the unknown prophet we spoke of before that told Ahab, hey, better be careful, you know, and, and went against him. And it seems that, um, in my mind, I think that's probably correct that Micah has done this. But Jehoshaphat was smart enough and, and uh, thinker enough that he told him, hey, don't say that. Don't say you hate a man of God. Uh, verse 9, Then the king of Israel called the officer, an officer and said, Hasten hither Micah, Micah the son of, of uh, Imlah. Verse 10, And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes. Hey, we're, we're dressing this up. We're going to look official here before the people in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, the judgment seat or thrashing floor, 
and all the prophets uh, prophesied before them. You got 400 fakes out there. I mean, it's a, like an old town camp meeting revival. We got more opinions floating around and people saying, God said this and God said that and God told me to tell you that you're a jerk and no, you're a jerk and God told me to tell you that he'll translate this for you so you'll understand that really you're the one that's a jerk. You know, all kinds of little messages from God by this bunch of nim nimcompoops here, whatever that may mean. But uh, you, know, you don't have to go very far today. Turn on your television and listen. You know, God told me where to park my car today. <laughs> now, surely you know our Father better than that. If a man hadn't got enough sense to know where to park his car, God's sure not going to take time to talk to him. All right? Sure talk to God today. Oh, well, great. That's good. You know, I, I mean, when you've got people like that around you, what can you say? And God does speak to people. I don't want to... I, I just have a lot of fun. All right? I mean, I enjoy this generation, believe it or not. It's... We have some very, you do not need, I no longer read the comic strips. I don't have to. All I have to do is turn my television on, and I don't do that very often. I don't have time. But, I mean, who could ask for more uh, and, a, and a better bunch of comedians? Fantastic, all right? But, hey, we got a real revival. I mean, we got a fellowship of preachers, prophets going on here, and they're all talking at once, prophesying, just laying it on the kings. I mean, impress the high dude, you know? Eleven. And Zedekiah, Zedekiah being the justice of Yah, the son of... Now, I want you to listen real carefully to, to this pronunciation the son of Kenaana. Sounds a lot like Kenite, doesn't it? Probably he was, but he was passing himself off with this name to be a son of Canaan, the um, Ham's child by his mother, all right? Made him horns of iron and said, and he said, um, this... Uh, this is, uh, he made them, this was buffalo horns, all right? I mean, boy, fighters, tigers they were, all right? Thus saith the Lord, with, um, with these, these horns, this prophet's tongue, with these, um, thou, with these thou shalt push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. That's what this fake is saying. I mean, you know, I mean, now bear in mind, that would be a very religious sight because that's kind of the way the horns signify power. Uh, Moses had done something similar. You know, I mean, hey, you know, that, that's impressive. Got 400 of them, super preachers. And we got this one, verse 12. And all the prophets prophesied so saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the king, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Now, this is one of those cases where our father would say, hey, you know something about those fakes, super preachers? They will say I said a certain thing, and I haven't said a thing to them. But they can sure put on a good show, all right? They can sure convince people that I'm in their midst. All right, verse 13. And the messenger that was gone to call M Micah, I'm going to call him, spake unto him, saying, now listen, this is the messenger that was sent. You think he didn't have his ear full and loaded for deception when he left to get Micah? Listen to this. He spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth, 400 of them all saying the same thing. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. I mean, hey, we've got 400 and the majority is always right. Micah, you go ahead and repeat what they're saying, and you won't be an oddball hanging off out here too much by yourself. Reminds me of the, again, of the rapture doctrine. 
Well, everybody teaches it practically. It must be so. There's just one problem. It isn't. Oh, but don't worry. It's going to be good. You're going to be just... And, it, and the, the real comedy is the pictures of cars and trucks, I mean, crossing freeways, and, and here are these uh, hummingbirds or butterflies are flitting out of here, you know, and, and uh, it's not biblical. Nowhere is it written in God's Word, unless you want to, to, to jockey the subject and object that the Greek is so final about. You better be careful, my friend, what you listen to in this generation. Everything's going to be fine. We have the victory. And we're going to defeat the spurious Messiah and the fake Jesus and all the fake uh, religious men. His ministers appear and say, as Jesus would warn in Matthew 24, many will come in my name. Yes, I be a preacher of Jesus. I'm holy, holy. Oh, holy, holy. Amen, amen. Oh, are you? Well, do you teach his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, or are you a one-verse rev? Get all revved up over one verse and change the subject off to something that is not written in God's word. I don't know. Hey, it's up to you, friend. This is a type, and you're in the generation of the fig tree. I would say sharpen up, and as you can tell, I'm out. We're, we're winning friends and influencing people today, you know. It's, but what's happening here is the religious community is trying to pressure a prophet of God to lie or to listen to them rather than who? And this is important, to listen to them rather than God. Okay, verse 14. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. It doesn't matter what this bunch of yahoos teaches or says. I will teach what the Lord tells me to. That's what he's saying, 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, Micah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? Now you're going to have to pick this up in my voice in the Hebrew, because it's here, and uh, it would really throw you in the English, but I've got to say it in the same tone that is emphasized in the manuscripts. He asked him, shall we go or shall we forbear? And he answered him, go. Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. He said it with irony, mocking the prophets all at the same time. You've got to get the whole picture. You're, in other words, he was strictly saying, if you want to kill yourself, go ahead, dude. You know, you're not hearing what God is saying. Okay, verse 16. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? In other words, Ahab knew he was, he was putting him on. All right? Verse 17. And he said, this is what God said. I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as a sheep that hath no shepherd. That means, Ahab, you're going to be killed. You're going to be dead, dude. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. In other words, God is stating that the king is going to die on that field of battle, and the people are going to come back and find peace, but Ahab, Ahab is not going to make it back. Verse 18, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Now, here's where, this is what really separates the men or the true listeners from those that will accept whatever in the heat of the moment. How sharp are you? I have taught, and maybe I could take the blame for not being quite as good a teacher as I should be, but I want to see how sharp you are. I'm going to just read ahead a verse or two here, 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. This is, uh, this is, um, 
Micah again, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left, 20. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab what, uh, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. I mean, right there in heaven, they were deciding, how can we get rid of this wet noodle? And this is the father and, and the host, 21. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him, 22. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith, how? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, Micah has laid it straight out to Ahab and Jehoshaphat. I repeat, I want to repeat that it's important. He reported this to both Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Verse 23. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, these super preachers. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now, listen, my friend. If you want to hear lies, God will allow you to because he expects more from you than to listen to untruths. He expects you to be able to think for yourself because he has sent you types and that that has been is now and that that has been around will come around again. That's types in history and you're supposed to pick up from it. Verse 24. But Zedekiah, the son of Kenianah, this little little merchant's what it means in the Hebrew, so you should be able to put it together. It's a Kenite. Went near and smote Micah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord for me to speak unto thee? Uh, or how did he do it? And you'll have some of that too. Verse 25. And Micah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into, the, into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Little prophet, when you're trying to run from one chamber to the other to hide yourself from the wrath of God, you'll know who sent it. Verse 26, And the king of Israel said, Take Micah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, 27, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread and affliction, and with water of affliction, until I come in peace. In other words, uh, that's about typical response for one that will really toe the mark and teach God's word. There's not that much popularity within it, all right? Wasn't then and is not much better off today. Verse 28, And Micah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. In other words, if Ahab comes back from this battle, then I'm the fake, and these dudes are your prophets. All right? And he said it to all the people, You hearken and you listen unto me. Now, that's a, that's a hard place to have to stop a lecture, but we're out of time. So we'll, we'll hold that till tomorrow. But I, want you, I want to, do want to give you a home assignment. The king of Judah and the king of uh, Israel here, you would have given the king of Judah a little more credit than what he deserves because you're going to see that even with the word of God having been spoken that he sought for, and this is the deeper message that I want you to get from it, he went anyway and just about paid with his life. Don't go along for a ride when you know God is not in it. That's the message, we'll, we'll, and we'll pick up on it in the next lecture. Fantastic. 
how good our Father is to us, that He gives us warnings as to how easily people can be deceived when they're being so religious. Think about it. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?